this video introduces between groups analysis of variance or between groups ANOVA and corresponds with chapter 12 in your textbook. The first thing that we need to talk about is that we've switched the kind of distributions that we're using. And so we're using what's called an F distribution because now we're working with more than two samples. So for all of those t-tests we just learned, we were talking about either using two samples or comparing a single sample with a population mean. So when you're working with only two samples, you can use the t-distribution. When you're using more than two samples, so three or more groups, then you want to use what's called analysis of variance. And you use that when you have two or more nominal independent variables, so whatever your categories are, and an interval dependent variable. So again, we still have some kind of scale variable for our outcome variable of interest. So why not use multiple t-tests? I mean, that seems like it would be pretty easy. If you had, say, three groups, then you'd only need three t-tests. Well, the problem is that if you have too many t-tests, what you end up doing is actually increasing your type 1 error rate. So for each test that you run, the probability of a type 1 error is 5%. But when you add more tests, then what you end up doing is increasing that type 1 error rate because they're, uh, they're somehow related. Um, you've got different groups for your particular variable. So essentially what can happen is that people can um, repeatedly run tests and say they did 100 t-tests. Well, with alpha being set to 0.05, five significant results will happen just due to chance. So we need to control for that. And we will come back and address that issue after we've talked about how we actually compute the F statistic for analysis of variance. So essentially what we do with the F distribution is we're looking at separating out or teasing apart the sources of variability that happens when you compare um, different group means. And the F statistic is the ratio of the variance between groups divided by the variance within groups. So you can think about the variance between groups as being um, how much of the differences in the means that we see is due to actual differences among those groups versus the variance within the groups where you're looking within, say, we have three treatment groups. We have um, a control group, we have the standard treatment, and we have a new treatment. So how much of the differences among people in the control group um, is due to just individual differences, which is what that variance within groups would get at. And you can imagine that if there's more variability that's between those groups, so differences, say, in anxiety scores, if we've got three different kinds of treatment, then what we would expect is that this F ratio would be very large because the variability between the groups accounts for um, a lot more of that variance than the variability within the groups. So really what we're saying is that the difference among the sample means is divided by the average of the sample variances. So we're looking at partitioning that variance. That's why it's called analysis of variance. So let's talk about um, some of these connections among the distributions. If you'll remember that the Z distribution, we know mu and we know sigma, and they are basically what we're trying to approximate with a T distribution. With a T distribution, because we only know the mu and not the sigma, then we have to use the T distribution because it's dependent upon the sample size. As the sample size approaches infinity or just gets very large, the T distribution is essentially the same as the Z distribution. We use the F distribution when we have three or more samples. You could use it with two samples. Um, and essentially with two samples, the F distribution is the square of the T distribution. If you remember that what we're using in our denominator, right, the, the bottom of our equation for the T statistic is a standard error. Um, but here we're analyzing variances, 
which you could have a squared standard error, and that would be equivalent. So the F distribution is essentially a square of the T distribution and could also be considered a square of the Z distribution if there are only two samples and the sample size is just really, really large. So those are our three distributions. If we have more than three distributions, you couldn't square the F and, and get the T distribution because now we're starting to talk about more than two sample means. So what we have to do, if you imagine that your variance is like a pie, and you could split that pie into um, different groupings. Um, so we have a between groups type of variance, which estimates the population variance based on the differences among the group means. And then we have a within groups, which estimates the population variance based on the differences within each sample distribution, so within each group. So we can split that pie into between groups variants, how much variability is due to being in a particular group versus how much variability is within the group, which is due to individual differences within each group. Okay, so here's really a kind of basic question here. Um, we've talked about between groups variance, and we've talked about within groups variance. The between groups variance goes on top, and the within groups variance goes on the bottom of your ratio. So take a minute and calculate what you believe the F statistic would be. If you said that the F statistic is 4, then you'd be correct, because you take that between groups variance of 8 and divide it by 2, and you get 4. So there are several types of analysis of variance. The first type that we're going to talk about is called a one-way analysis of variance, or one-way ANOVA. And in this case, we have a single nominal variable that has more than two levels. So in the example I gave you, we're looking at interventions that treat anxiety, and we have a control group. They're probably waitlisted. They can't get in to see the therapist yet. They have the standard treatment, and then they have some new treatment that they want to investigate, whether it's better than the standard treatment. And so we have a single scale dependent variable. Maybe we use the state trade anxiety scale um, and we just use the, the um, trade anxiety. We could also have what's called a within groups analysis of variance. Here again, we have more than two samples with the same participants, um, but it's each participant gets each level of the independent variable. And so what we see is something analogous to a paired samples t-test, however, more than two groups. We could also call this repeated measures. So we might have, you know, um, test scores at the beginning of the school year, test scores at the middle of the school year, and test scores at the end of the school year. It's the same people across time, but we're looking to see whether there's some change in their reading ability, for example. Lastly, we can have um, what's called a between groups um, factorial ANOVA, where you have more than two samples with different participants in each sample. And so here, this is analogous to that between groups design. You could have a one-way within groups analysis of variance or a one-way between groups analysis of variance. Excuse me, I said factorial before. That's more complicated. That we'll talk about in chapter 14. But here, you can either have a between groups design or a within groups design. So we're going to start by talking about the one way between groups analysis of variance. And so here are all the steps. You'll notice that these uh, steps are basically the same as what we've been doing all along. We have to figure out what our populations are. Here they're going to be at least three. Our distribution is going to be an F distribution. And we're going to have to talk about some assumptions, some of which are new. We state our null and research hypotheses. We figure out what our characteristics of the comparison distribution is, what's our critical value, what's the test statistic, and then we make a decision about that null hypothesis. So again, the process is pretty much the same. So let's start by talking about the assumptions of analysis of variance. The first is random selection of samples. This is the same as what we've had in the t-test, and it has uh, an impact on our ability to generalize to our populations of interest. So again, random selection doesn't always happen, but it does help us with generalizability. The second is that we have normally distributed sample. 
so again, what we're saying is that um, it goes back to the central limit theorem that um, if we have a sample size of 30 or greater, then we probably do have um, sufficient sample size to assume normality. This last one, this is a new one, homoskedasticity. So this is, you know, your quarter word for the day. It's, uh, it's a new one, a big wor word. And if you know um, what homogenized milk is, right, where the, the cream and the milk are um, combined so well that the molecules of cream are evenly distributed within the milk. So the cream doesn't float to the top. Well, that's what we're talking about here. Homogeneity um, has to do with um, the, the variability of it within each population, within each group, is the same. Okay, so we can call that homogeneity of variance as another way um, to refer to it. Or you can say, you know, um, we've met the assumption of homoskedasticity. So the populations, what we're saying is the samples come from populations with the same variance. Here's another example of what I'm talking about. This distribution that is in the green background shows uh, meeting the assumption of homogeneity of variance. You'll notice that the variability, the spread of each of these distributions is the same. But in the orange, we see that this middle distribution has a much lower spread than the other two distributions. So it's different for the sample. So we can't meet that assumption. And therefore, we should not use a parametric test that assumes homogeneity of variance. OK, so for our characteristics in step three, we now have a couple of different things we need to do in terms of finding out what our degrees of freedom are. So for, for degrees of freedom between, so for the between groups variability, it's the number of levels of your independent variable minus one, or the number of groups minus one. So in our case where we have the standard treatment, the control group, and a new treatment, we have three different groups. So our de degrees of freedom between would be two. In degrees of freedom within, what we're looking at is the degrees of freedom for um, each of the different groups. So if you have, say, 30 people in your first group, and you have 28 in your second and 28 in your third, your degrees of freedom for the first group will be 30 minus 1. And your degrees of freedom for the second group will be 28 minus 1. And the degrees of freedom for the third group will be also 28 minus 1. So then we would sum those together. And we would say that we have, oh, 53 degrees of freedom, I believe. If we add those together. So, so we have um, 29 plus 27 plus 27. And that will give us the degrees of freedom within. We can also compute the total degrees of freedom for the entire sample as saying the total number of participants in all of the groups and subtracting one. So essentially what that ends up being is the degrees of freedom between plus the degrees of freedom within gives us the total degrees of freedom. So take a minute and check your understanding. What are the degrees of freedom if there are three levels of the independent variable? And if there are a total of 20 participants in each of the three levels, what is your degrees of freedom within? So pause and calculate. So with three levels of the independent variable, we find that we have 3 minus 1, which is 2. And if you had 20 participants in each of those three levels, our degrees of freedom within would be 19 plus 19 plus 19, which would give us 57 degrees of freedom within. Now we have a new table that we're going to use. Again, it's in your appendix. You'll notice that you have within groups degrees of freedom, which is in your denominator, and between groups degrees of freedom, which is in your numerator. So if we had two degrees of freedom and say that we had um, between groups and we had 13 within groups, and then you can see the middle row here is alpha is 0.05, our critical value would be 3.80. An F distribution, because it is squared, only has a single tail. So we put all of that 5% in one tail. 
I will continue in the next video talking about the